room and then we'll we'll start it. I see Ada's already here. <laughs> hey Ada, how are you? Happy holidays. Ada's actually part of my um MIT um, moderator group. <laughs> ah, very nice. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started here in a couple of seconds. We've got people coming into the room, so. All right. Yeah, let's see. All right. Ada says she met you at uh, CES 4. Only one I didn't go to. I spoke at CES uh, 1 and 2. Didn't make CES 4 because I had a heart attack the year before, so I kind of was still recuperating from that, but. Are you going to go to uh, CES this year or next year, 17? Um, I probably will and may end up speaking. I'm not sure what Jim's plans are for me. Jim never. T Jim will contact me and tell me, um, hey, um, I want you to speak or, you know, he'll just let me know. But I probably will. It's in Orlando. I mean, I went to the first one. That's where the very first one I spoke was in Orlando. So we'll have uh, to see how that, you know, how that pans out and health-wise for me too. Definitely, for sure. All right, so we got people in the room, so we're going to open it up. Hey, guys. Uh, happy holidays to you all, and uh, welcome to another episode of Pro Seller Talk. Senior and I am the host, and today I am honored to have with me Eddie Levine. Eddie Levine started in a garage in about five hundred dollars in, or is it five hundred or five thousand dollars in credit debt? Five thousand. Five thousand dollars in credit debt, and has built what he has now, what we call a multi empire, a multi million dollar seller. So. And he's going to be sharing with you how he started and how he goes through his process of how he um, picks wholesale products and, and things like that. So I'm really honored to have him here tonight. I hope you guys are ready and um, know that you're going to learn a lot of different things from Eddie. Hey, Eddie, glad to have you. Hey, John, thanks so much for the invite. I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. So a little bit about my background, uh, where I started from. I come from about 15 years of e-com experience. Uh, my very first e-com uh, venture was on eBay back when I was about 13, 14 is when I first started my business there. Um, so I ran that for a while before I did the whole school thing and, and that kind of dropped off the wayside. But um, specifically into uh, shifting gears into this Amazon business and kind of where I started with, uh, with this business as a whole, um, it started back in 2012 and we were originally an RA seller only. Um, and uh, we built this business into into its seven figure business into its first million um, just doing RA from one major retailer. Um, and we took the RA approach a little bit differently. We did not go just to the RA um, locations around our Chicagoland area. Um, my partner and I would travel around the country and we would hit um, the various stores of this one retailer uh, in, in a variety of major cities. So whether it be Dallas or LA or uh, Detroit or Minneapolis, it didn't really matter where. Um, but we would focus on this one retailer because we knew their system inside and out. Um, and in the course of a weekend, which is normally when we would do our sourcing trips, we could hit about 30 to 45 stores between the two of us. Um, and uh, we would um, fill up two uh, Yukon XLs or suburban type vehicles, just floor to ceiling with, with, with product. Um, we would have U-Haul trailers attached to them if we had overflow. Um, and if we were in a city that um, uh, was too far for us to drive, say Dallas or LA, um, we would just coordinate with uh, with a company like Uline and we would have pallets sent to us directly uh, for us to send the product back to our location in Chicago. Um, so then we would just send it all back. It would come in via freight to our location and um, we would fly home. So that was kind of what we did um, week in and week out uh, for the first year to year and a half of our business. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of covered our, uh, where we were from when I started in, in a garage to our first location, which was run kind of out of a storage facility. Um, they had a lot of, um, amenities for us as sellers that, that came in very handy, like a dock, um, and internet access and someone to receive things for us. So it, it was kind of a full service facility. 
Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, we were there for the first uh, year, year, year and a half, like I mentioned. And um, what really transitioned, what really got us transitioned from the uh, RA model into the wholesale side, which is what we practice now, um, is I, I had to ask myself a question. And, and that was, given where we were at the time, which was, you know, about a million dollars in, in annual revenue, I asked myself the question of, do I want to continue the business where it is now and, and be perfectly happy with where I am? Or do I want to grow this into ultimately a five, 10, 20, $30 million business? Like I've seen certain other sellers uh, have the ability to do. And so of course that was the answer. The answer to my question was, yes, I'd love to get to that point. But then I asked myself a second question, which was, can I get to that point using just the model that I have today, which was at the time, again, just the RA practicing from one store. Um, and the answer that I got, was no. Um, and it's not to say that it can't be done at all, but given the amount of people that we had, the two of us were only well, only one sourcing, uh, and the amount of product that we were able to acquire over X period of time, it just wasn't going to happen in that method. So we decided we would transition into the all wholesale model. Um, and so in 2014, approximately, uh, we stopped doing RA completely, never did the OA model, just for the record, um, and we transition into all wholesale. And uh, that's kind of where we are today. So the model that we practice today is um, is a little bit unique. We do not like to spread ourselves around, um, across a lot of products. Um, given our size today, we still only focus on about, depends on the time of year, this is obviously peak season, but um, I, said, I would say our average number of SKUs is right around 60. So we are very, very heavy and big believers into the buy deep and not wide model. Um, and that's actually a question that I get a lot of times is which way is better, go deep or go wide? And the answer to that uh, that I would say is um, you can do it either way. We have just found it to be very successful for us when we've gone deep. Um, and that's because on our wholesale side, um, the reason we've been able to be so successful is we've created partnerships with a lot of distributors and manufacturers and um, and what have you um, to build that relationship and be able to leverage some of the um, uh, some of our value add and uh, buy in such large quantities um, for those for those suppliers to make it kind of work worth their while to work with us as a seller. Um, of course, we give them other values as well uh, in terms of promoting their products and and multi channel and all those things. But um, being able to buy in quantity and being able to source directly from China or um, buy a full container at a time or a whole truckload has kind of uh, allowed us to grow at the rate that we've been able to grow uh, to today. So I have a I question, have a question Eddie. Eddie. Mm -hmm. so, so when you when say you're buying, buying tea, tea. are you also, because um, I do a lot of wholesale, when you're working with wholesales, are you working on exclusive deals with them or where you have the exclusive line for them or are you just being able to just buy deep from them? It depends on the, on the vendor. There are some vendors of ours that we do have exclusives with, whether it be them as a whole uh, or a certain product. Um, there are other vendors where we are one of three or one of six approved sellers for a certain channel like Amazon or, or you know, just something and something of that nature, um, and there's other vendors that we don't have exclusivity on that we're working on it, and and, and uh, of course we want to get to that point, but it really just depends, um, and whether or not we buy from from them in in a very large volume doesn't necessarily correlate to having ex uh, any type of exclusivity. Um, of course, that's that's um, a great thing to have, but it really depends on the opportunity and the deal that we're presented to see if it's really worth our while to invest that much into whatever the particular product uh, happens to be. So for people that are on this uh, webinar and listening, you're talking about buying deep. Now when you're buying deep and you're actually, you actually mentioned containers and stuff like that from, um, you know, from overseas, I do that myself and I know that it requires a larger capital investment to do that. Um, but I also know that buying that if you're buying from a wholesaler and like you said, you built these relationships, relationships are built and on actually you being able to move the product for them. They're not looking, they're not looking for you to just buy a container and, and take six months to move it. So 
are you working on limited margins to be able to move volume? No, I, I think that the, the key to our success has been um, being able to promote their products in a, in a manner that has been above and beyond what they're currently doing, number one, um, really driving traffic to their, to their products. And number two, having multiple outlets. Um, you know, Amazon, Amazon FBA, of course, is a big outlet for us, but we have other channels as well, whether it be to um, B2B or through another e-commerce channel or, or what have you. It, it doesn't really make a difference. It's just having more outlets obviously is going to equate to more sales. Like we sell, for example, we sell Amazon Direct certain products. Um, it, it just, it really depends. Um, but, uh, you know, if we're going to buy in such large volume from a vendor, it's going to be a product that we are either have done in smaller quantities before and we're confident of its of its sales ability or it's something that based on the deal and based on the pricing and based on the potential ROI um, it makes sense for us to go um, very deep into the into quantity and, and and again when I say deep in quantity I'm not talking you know a skit or two at a time I'm talking 500 a thousand 10,000 15,000 units I mean that's a normal purchase for us and when you're doing those size purchases, what do, what do you project as your turnaround time for someone on here that's probably scared now that what are your projections of turnaround times for that? I mean, what do you look at as far as um, when you have to be able to turn it around that makes sense for you? I, ideally, of course, you want to turn around inventory as fast as possible, right? So, um, for example, if you put it on a credit card, um, you normally have what between 30 and 90 days to pay it. So that's, you know, that's something to consider if you're paying cash, that's, that's great. Sometimes we've done that. Um, but that just means that your, um, cash flow can be, can be tied up for a while if you don't have an outlet to sell it. Right. Um, if you're taking a loan, you might have six months, a year or three years, depending on the loan to pay it off. But, um, then how much interest are you paying? So there's a lot of questions. It depends on how you're, how you're financing it and, and what your cash flow is. Um, but I would say on top of that, it really depends also on um, what kind of product it is. For example, um, if it's a seasonal product, you might not want to buy that at the end of summer if it's a summer product because you know you're going to be sitting on it for probably a year. Um, but on the flip side, um, I'll give you an example. Yeah, uh, last year, toward in uh, early December, we had bought a, a Christmas item, um, and it was a, it was a toy for, for specifically meant for for the holiday season. And we had purchased about 5,500 of these products uh, in the second week of December. So we really didn't have a lot of time to sell them, obviously. But um, having done our research, we saw that in the holiday season, November, December, these item, this item was not only inflated price-wise, but was worth selling at a rate of 100 to 200 units a day. Um, and that's if you were sharing the buy box. If you had the buy box by yourself, you were selling even more. Um, so in in the week or so, two weeks that we were able to sell those units last year, out of the 5,500 that we bought, we still blew through about close to 2,000 units. Um, and that's an item that I didn't mind holding for the another year, and we actually sold out of it this year, um, just because the ROI was north of 300%. Um, so, you know, that was, that was, that made sense for us. So I think you've got to evaluate it based on a deal perspective, based on the timing, and based on your funding as well. Yeah, I agree with that. So someone that's on here um, listening and looking for wholesale products, obviously you're buying large quantities and you say you, you research it. If you don't mind sharing some of the methods that you do to research the products to, so that you know that buying deep makes sense for you. Sure. So of course, the first thing you're going to look at is pricing history. You're going to see um, you know, what it's sold for in the past. You use things like camel, 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 or or whatever tool you have um, to see kind of what 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 uh, has changed. You know who uh, you know has it changed with the season? Has it changed with uh, you know the number of sellers or or what have you? Um, you're also going to look at who's been selling the product. So has Amazon been selling it, or has it just been third party? Um, is Amazon just temporarily out of stock? Have they never carried it? Um, you know if, if they're if they're selling it, what what have they been selling it for? All those things kind of play into perspective because. Everybody knows that if you're competing with Amazon, for example, sometimes it's a lot harder to win the buy box. That they can go down and they can just, you know, eat you alive. Um, so uh, we look at things like that. 
Uh, I look at the size of the item to see how much storage space I'll need. Um, I look at, um, you, you know, the biggest thing I look at when I, when I look at an opportunity is, of course, I look at the long-term ROI, how much I'm going to make in total. But more closely, I'm looking at the initial investment. So let's say I spend 10000 on on a purchase, right? Um, if I can ultimately make 40000 that's awesome. Um, but what I'm looking at specifically is, of that 10000 that I had to invest initially, how long is it going to take me to recoup my initial investment? Yeah, that's very important because if it's going to take me a solid year to, or six months even to, to recoup the $10,000, you can imagine how long it's going to take you to make a profit. And you've got to think about how many more products and how many more things could you possibly invest in that even if it was a smaller ROI, if you can do that three or four times over, you're better off doing that. You know what I'm saying? Um, so we look at, I look at that too. You know, if it's something that I can pay off the initial investment in, in a period of a few weeks and then I can start making profit, that looks very attractive to me. Um, so, you know, all those things kind of combine sort of, I, uh, sort of go into the mix uh, on, on, all, on all the deals that we consider. So when you're, when you're looking at products though, when you're looking at what products to evaluate, mm -hmm. Categories work well for you, and how are you evaluating them? Are you going on Amazon's um, and looking on Amazon to see how products are doing? Are you using Google Scout, or what kind of tools are you using to help you evaluate um, what is actually a good product for you that you think that would be a profitable product? So we are not product specific or category specific uh, on what we'll buy. We pretty much will try anything. There are certain categories that I stay away from. Um, and this is just me. This is not me telling you that they're bad categories. This is just my preference. Um, clothing, shoes, uh, health and beauty, personal care, um, books, um, things like that. Um, we have we have not done a whole whole lot in um, jewelry, for example. That's just that that's not our core focus. Um, stuff that really works well for us is toys, home and garden, lawn and garden. Um, kitchen, um, baby, automotive, um, things of that nature have, have we've had success with. Um, but again, we'll, we'll consider anything. Um, and when I'm looking at product and, and evaluating it, I'm of course evaluating based on what I see in Amazon, but I'm also evaluating based on where I'm going to sell the product to myself. Because if I'm going to sell to B and B uh, to to a business to business, then what Amazon says about the product is kind of irrelevant, you know. Um, but uh, things like reviews, for example, if I see a great deal on a product, but I see that the product has two and a half or three stars, it's going to make me nervous because I know that one, I'm probably going to get a lot of returns. Two, there's obviously a problem or some kind of some kind of defect, for lack of a better term, with the product that is not getting as high quality reviews. Um, but more importantly. You know, Amazon prides itself on, on selling quality and product and not having customers who who are upset with their experience or get poor uh, manufactured products. So um, there have been deals where um, from an ROI perspective and from a cost perspective, they have made sense for us. But just due to the sheer risk of uh, of that, that, would, that we would have uh, based on quality, we've passed on them. Um, we value our Amazon account too much. We don't want Amazon to come back and saying we're creating a bad buyer experience. Things of that nature that we're that we are um, always keeping in mind when we are evaluating opportunities to see if it's a right fit for our business. So when you're looking at products and you're looking on Amazon, are you more brand driven when you're looking for these products, or is it does it matter about the brand? Just matters whether or not it's a product that you think would sell well on there. And do you also look and say, hey, how often do you find things or how, how many products do you have that you bring to market that you've done research and say, hey, this is a great product. It's not on Amazon and we think it'll do well. Mm -hmm. So the, the pr our primary focus is to focus on brands that already have a listing, that already have a presence online. Um, we don't like to, it's not that we don't like to, we don't have, it's not our, it's not, it's not our key go-to-market strategy to find brands that don't already exist in the platform and bring them into market. I know people that do do that and they do very successful with it and they have tremendous success, but it's not, it doesn't fit into what we've built so far. 
Um, it requires a lot more work, a lot more patience, a lot more trial and error um, to see if, it, it, if it's going to have success. And that's just not how we built the wholesale model that we have today. Um, but that being said, we do have vendors who are very popular and are very um, have a high rate of sales on certain certain products of theirs on the Amazon platform. And a lot of times they'll launch new products. And when they have new products that they want to launch under their brand that are new to the platform, a lot of times we will consider those because their brand as a whole already has a good footprint. So we will work with them to launch new product under their brand. That's something that we're more familiar with as opposed to a brand as a whole being new to the platform. So when you're um, when you're evaluating these products on Amazon, um, what criteria of do you allow to be on the listing? In other words, do you have a criteria of like if there's more than eight sellers or more than six sellers on there that you stay away from that type of um, product? You know, I, I really never have uh, have let the number of sellers uh, scare me into not purchasing a product. Um, of course, there's an exception to that where if we happen to find an item where there's, you know, dozens of dozens of sellers and we can clearly see that there's, it would probably have be, have to be, it would probably have to be more than 10 or 15 sellers that, you know, right around that buy box price within a few pennies for me to get concerned. Um, but honestly, the, the products that we purchase since they're not from, from RA and they're from a a wholesaler or a manufacturer that we've built a relationship with, most times, I would say nine out of 10 times, um, we rarely run into that much competition on a particular listing. So uh, we might have two or three or four. Um, but even with that, usually a few of them are outside of the buy box range anyway, are a couple of dollars higher. Um, they're not ones to usually drive down the price. Um, so it's not really a concern of ours, um, and it doesn't really, uh, we don't really go up against it a whole lot. And yeah, that's probably like you said, because there, there's not a whole lot of competition um, on the wholesale side. And plus, you're, if you're buying it at a better price, um, it's going to be hard to compete with that, to compete with what price you can sell it for, too. I mean, it depends on how they're buying it Correct. and having, having those relationships. So... What is some of the key takeaways for someone that, obviously, this is a, a different type of a webinar. It, yes, it's about wholesale, but most of the webinars I do that I talk about wholesale, I always talk about when you're first starting out, you want to go wide because you want to test things and make sure before you jump in and buy 15,000 units of a, a given product. But you did quite the opposite. You, you kind of did your research and found out that you can get in these items and you've got less than 10 FBA sellers and you're going to be within that buy box and it kind of makes sense for you to be able to go that route but what advice would you give now we're talking about someone new starting out that is listening to this and here that I need to go deep but doesn't have the capital how would you how would you um, what kind of advice would you give them to be able to you know jump into wholesale but not on the same magnitude that you are well I, I think I I would have a two-part answer to that question. Number one, if you're brand new, a lot of a lot of times you get confused when you hear the term wholesale, or you don't really under. A lot of people don't really understand um, what wholesale really means to me. Um, here's what wholesale does not mean to me: it does not mean go buy from 88 lots or bulk or one of those liquidation type companies. It's not wholesale to me. That's using a middleman, third party to buy liquidation inventory. That liquidation and wholesale to me are two totally different ball games. Okay, wholesale also to me is not going to a show like ASD and meeting with the vendors there and buying a few pallets or or larger quantities of those products. I say that kind of with an asterisk at the end because there at ASD there are some vendors who are the manufacturer who are the brand. So that's you know that's one thing. But at ASD, if you, especially if you've been there, in the South Hall, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of the companies there are closeout liquidation type overstock companies. So that is not traditional wholesale. Traditional wholesale to me is when I go to, um, you know, the hardware show in Vegas or some kind of show that has a, um, a category specific focus and I meet with a lot of the vendors there 
who are the manufacturer, who are the brand owner, like nine out, of, nine out of 10 people at that show are the actual source, right? That's wholesale to me when I'm paying, when normal wholesale is 50% off of a list. That is what I call wholesale. Yeah, like so when you go to Javits Center and you, um, you go to the toy fair. Exactly, like that's another, that's another show as an example, right? So, so that to me is wholesale. Um, so that part, that's the first answer to your question is, is understanding the difference between liquidation, ASD type and, and wholesale itself. And part B, which is more of what you asked me about is understand that when you approach a vendor, buying big and being able to take quantity and move a lot of product for them, of course, it's going to be great. You know, it's a big order for them. That's, it means a lot of money. That's awesome. But more importantly, especially as the amount of sellers have grown on the Amazon platform and on e-commerce in general, brands have, or the manufacturers have a brand to protect. They have products to protect. They have employees' lives to protect. They have a lot at stake. Um, and they have retail relationships to protect. You know, just because you're selling these products from a brand doesn't mean you're their only game in town. These guys are trying to get their products on retailers' store shelves. So a lot of times when these when these brands are um, tight-lipped about who they'll sell to and they're weary about talking to you and they may just you know uh, brush you off as as just another e-commerce seller is because they have those things that that, that they're that they hold so valuable to them um, and because they don't know you you are a threat to them threat to them unless you can prove them otherwise and in order to prove otherwise you've got to you've got to show them that you care more about just care more about their product than just selling it online you care about the long-term viability of their business of their brand you want to help them um, break into channels that don't that they don't yet exist on um, you want to help them promote their products whether it be with uh, you know sponsored ads or PPC or whatever you know whatever you want to do um, you want to be a partner with them you do not want to just sell alongside of them you want to sell you want to be an asset to them. You want to be someone who's going to um, help them long term to where if they didn't have you, um, their sales would suffer. Having you essentially increases the the uh, the overall sales for their um, company, and without without uh, giving them so much risk in terms of you know worrying about their map price being violated or or watching their products tank, you've got to offer them a value add. Um, if you if you go to a trade show and you approach a vendor or you call them over the phone or you email them and you just say, hey, I'm you know, Joe Smith and I'm, I sell on Amazon, I wanna sell your product, don't expect positive results. Don't expect it. I mean, you're probably gonna be denied all every other time because you are offering them nothing. Ask yourself the question, what's in it for them? If you can't literally tell them at least three things, or if you can't tell yourself at least three things, you've got a problem. You've gotta figure out what's in it for them because until until you are granted access to selling their products, you are the salesperson. Even though you're the customer, you're the salesperson until you get past that hump. Once you get in with the with the vendor, then you become their customer, and then you can really branch out. But until then, you have to sell yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. When I've, I've been to many trade shows, and um, it's always what's in it for them. And the one thing they want to hear is if you are selling on Amazon, uh, they do want you to keep map pricing and they do want you to be able to honor so that you're not getting in trouble or they're not getting in trouble with their brick and mortar stores. They want you to be in line with what's going on on the outside and you'll monitor the pricing for them. And if anybody's going below map and you'll police it and things like that, those are the type of things they want to hear. But I know a lot of people that go to trade shows uh, for the first time or ability to uh, talk to the vendors the way they um, they should would probably get intimidated when the vendors the first thing they're going to say to you most times is because they're aware of it or well, Hasbro and they're going to ask you right away if you sell on Amazon they're going to come right up to you and say you know do you sell the product on Amazon and like you said if you do you don't have an answer on how to com combat that then you're going to be you're going to be in trouble and they're not going to sell to you I guess my question to you is with the brand names that you're selling, do you stay away from the big brands like the Mattels, the Hasbro's, the Fisher Price, the Lego? Because there's a lot of competition there and the margins from Hasbro, Mattel, Fisher Price, and those type, they don't have real big margins when you're buying wholesale. 
Um, I beg to differ. I buy from those brands uh, regularly and make good margin. From Mattel and those type of guys? Yep. Because I know, it, well, maybe it depends on the quantity you're buying, but I know that their margin. It depends. I mean, I mean, those guys, those guys offer you the ability to buy domestically, and you can also buy from direct import, um, right? Overseas. Um, I think it's more a question of 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 the conversations you've had with the vendor and again your value add. You mean, I, I mean, I have reps for some of those companies who I talk to all the time, and we we look at product and we we find options that are viable and things that are are coming on the pipeline is new and you know I sometimes I get I get warning of it over email or a quick phone call sure. um, so I would say it's definitely not a, a good beginner tactic to go after those huge companies because they're gonna want to want to deal with someone who kind of knows the model and knows what they're doing um, so I would say probably not the best to start with them but is it possible to buy from them and make money absolutely yeah, you can make money. It's just, um, at least from my experience, and we bought large quantities from them from overseas before, from Mattel and Hasbro, and their margins on wholesale, even when they sell to the big box stores, I had uh, quite a few um, sales reps I knew that even sold to the big box stores say that um, they're, some of their things, but you can find things like when they come out with the new cars and things like that, the margins are there, and some of the newer products, but they also have things that you got to watch. Like you said, you got to look at that the margins aren't there. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Take a company like Mattel or Hasbro, right? These guys have thousands of products uh, in their in their inventory. I mean, the amount of products that they cover is, is massive. I mean, their catalog is huge. Um, the advantage you have as an e-com seller is the market and who has what product and what the price point is will change all the time. In general, their pricing for the product won't. So, um, it's, poss it's very possible that a lot of their products in September, for example, um, may look poor. But then if you check it one month later in October, it might be a whole different ballgame. Um, I just, you know, in right, you know, 100 feet from me in, my, in the warehouse part of our location here, I've got, I'm sitting on a, half a truckload of Mattel product. Um, and this is stuff that I paid $35 for that the buy box is sitting at 90 so, um, because the value, so went up. say again, because the value of it went up. Well, because because the, the value went up, or just there's just not a lot of competition on the listing. I mean, I, I I researched that product before I bought it, and it's not like it just went up now because the holiday season. It's been elevated for a while. I mean, yeah, um, that's what I'm saying. You can find these products here and there, month after month, that will make you a good chunk of change. I mean, this is again for us because we're buying such high volume, high volume. I can't afford to buy. Um, a, a huge amount of product that's in toys that's ranked twenty, thirty, fifty thousand in rank. It doesn't make sense for me because I would I would sit on it forever. Right. Um, so when I look at toys, I like under five thousand. So you know this particular product. I mean, that one is ranked. I think at last check like thirty nine hundred. Um, there's another product of mine that's a lot smaller margin, um, but it's ranked number fifteen. Or it was ranked fifteen or twenty in toys. I mean, that sells every minute. Yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm happy to t I'm happy to take ten or fifteen points on that. Are you kidding me? It's a turn and burn. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah, and that's the thing with those uh, with those companies is that you do really got to do your research to find them because I, I hear it all the time from people that Mattel and Hasbro and Fisher Price and those type companies and even Lego, which Lego, you know, if you can get Lego to sell you to you, you're doing really well because Lego doesn't want to be opening up any account. So if you mm -hmm. if you have Lego, then hats off to you because Lego to sell to me and they're very difficult to to deal with. They don't want to be opening up anymore, especially online. They're, they're um, if you have a brick and mortar store, it's a little bit different. You can get in. Here, here, here's so here's your thing. I want to talk. I want to tell you about trade shows. Right, two things. One. Um, if you're nervous about approaching a vendor and you've never done it before and you need to get into the mindset of, of you know doing it and getting comfortable and, and not being uh, not not having that pessim pessimistic uh, view on it um, my advice go to a show and approach some smaller vendors that you don't feel would be the best seller online practice with them what's the worst thing that can happen it actually turns out to be good right so to get your practice out with vendors that you don't want to um, necessarily grow, and you really want to focus on. You know, get the practice ones out of the way. Who cares? Um, these guys are these guys talk to people all the time, and 
just having a conversation with you is not going to change anything. So that's number one. Um, and then number two, in terms of map agreements, I've had plenty of them in, in, in my in my day that uh, have wanted me to sign a map agreement and have their policies laid out. And I've and for the most part, I've got no problem with those because it's, it's really protection for both of you. But there's one thing I do look for in a map agreement. Um, because when we talk about relationships, to me, a relationship is is a two-way street built on the foundation of trust and respect. Um, and if you've seen me in other webinars and you've seen me speak uh, in person, I use that line all the time. Um, and uh, honestly, I use it because it's so true. Um, so because I'm building a relationship with somebody, I need to have that trust factor and I need to have respect, right? So I'm okay with agreeing to their terms, but then I want my terms on there as well. And that's simply put, um, if this map price gets violated by somebody else, by one of your other sellers, what recourse do I have as one of your retailers so I'm not buried with product? Because in my mind, if they've gone through this process of setting up a map agreement and they're, you know, watching the listing so carefully and they want everyone to abide by these policies and they and they claim that everyone is playing fair, they should have no problem giving me some kind of out clause if in fact they can't control their own map, right? It's a two-way street. So I'll abide by your map, but at the same time, I want you to cover me if things get out of control. And I have, it, it's literally my agreement uh, with some of my vendors that if, if map stays violated for a period of two or three weeks, what's your address here? It's coming come back, give me a credit. Simple as that. Yeah, you gotta have that. You gotta be able to protect yourself as well as to protect themselves. So, it's so, interesting. so, so don't don't be afraid of of looking at a map agreement and manipulating it uh, in in certain ways to protect your business as well. I mean, it it, it should be it should be a two way agreement. Minimum yeah, adverti min minimum advertised price. Lou just asked is is what it stands for. Yeah. Minimum advertised price. And I've absolutely done what you said. I mean, when I talk about math agreements, we always ask um, what's in it for us too. I mean, how are we protected? Because yeah, you want to be protected because what happens if you go in and you buy $10,000 worth of this product and then all of a sudden you go on Amazon and you see the map price by four of these people is not being honored. You got to be able to go back to that vendor and say, hey, listen, um, I need you to fix this. I mean, this is what's happening here. And if they don't fix it, then you need to be able to say, you know what, I'm sending the product back. You're absolutely right. And and talking about the vendors and and you know being new and going, I talk about that in my book. I co-wrote a book called Beyond Arbitrage, and I talk about that in my book about when you're first starting out to go to the vendors that you don't even want to buy at just to test them and, and you know and practice with them. And yeah, you don't want to do that because you don't want to waste their time either. Their time is valuable, but like you said, it's a perfect place for someone that's not used to talking to somebody to throw questions and get answers and and get stumble blocks that you're not used to, but you're going to start to learn these things and learn how to talk to vendors and learn how to control a conversation the way that you need to. And it's very important. And it, and it can be intimidated for somebody new going in there and wanting to talk to a vendor that's never done it before. If you're not, if you don't like to talk to people and you can't do that face to face, you're gonna have a hard time trying to deal with a vendor in a major trade show like the toy fair or like even the one that you talked about, the tool show. I've been to that one out in Vegas too. And, you know, so you want to start somewhere slow. And I tell them, don't even go to those shows. Go to the local small shows and practice there because it's more intimate and you've got, you know, not as many people go to them. And you can actually, um, you know, learn at those shows how to talk and, and what to say and what not to say and those things. And also, the other, the other side of that coin at the small shows is you can really do what you said is you can build intimate business relationships when you've got that one-to-one -one and you're in a little cubicle in these little shows where you actually have time to spend with them and before you know it you built that relationship and you're getting referrals and I know that you must have referrals based on what you do over the years because I know I do from what I've been able to do. One of the biggest questions I get some, uh, from vendors is who else have you worked with and if you can answer that question with other vendors especially in their category that you work with that's going to set you apart so much from other people because for as big as this industry is, e-commerce in general, the, and the amount of vendors there are, this is one small world. And this is why I tell people not never to lie to a vendor um, and tell and don't tell them, be honest with where you're, where you're selling or how you operate because they will find out and it will come back to bite you. Um, all it takes is you know, for you to tell different stories to different people and then they connect the dots. And if they don't, their stories don't match up, 
you're blow your chance out of the window. You're you're done. Um, and you know, you mentioned the, the show Toy Fair, for example. Um, I, it's funny for those of you who have been to Toy Fair, you you you, you probably understand this, but um, for those of you who haven't, I'll break it down to you like this: Toy Fair is a, is in the Javits Center. Um, it's the same location that hosts the New York Auto Show, so it's massive. Um, and there's two floors, uh, and each floor has, God, I don't know, maybe like 50 aisles of vendors. It's it's just so big. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's huge. So, but here's how I look at it, right? The bottom floor I, I consider my freshmen and sophomores. <laughs> uh, the top floor I consider my juniors and seniors. And he, and here's what I mean by that: the bottom floor, you have a lot more vendors in the bottom floor because they're smaller booths. They're people who are most a lot of them are not yet on Amazon or, or don't have don't have really a lot of traction with their listings. They're more apt to talk to you about stuff, and they're good people to practice on and get your feet wet with. Once you graduate and go to the upper class, the juniors and seniors upstairs, it's a whole different ball game. Those guys are um, they've done this before. They know how to how to smell out a new seller from a mile away. Um, they know what questions to ask you before you even think of, of, of what to ask them. You know, just by your just by your um, your body language, they kind of they they can know if you're serious or not, or if you or if you're just kind of winging it. Um, it it's it's one of the most it's one of the craziest shows that uh, that I can think of to to just kind of do a comparison with because um, I mean I I joke that when a when a when a, uh, a vendor goes from the the first floor up to the top, second floor, they've graduated into the big leagues because it's so true. Yeah, they, they actually have it, it's not open that open that often, but they actually have a third floor that, oh, they, yeah. on that Javits Center. And yeah. that's usually the private area where you can have private time up there. Yeah. We have a couple of um, questions. Um, Ada had one a while back. She put, who, who keeps your inventory and do you ship directly to Amazon? Yeah, so we um, I've got a warehouse right in back of me that's about 10,000 square feet. Um, that's our that's our current and uh, home of our operation for about uh, the last year and a half. Um, so yeah, everything comes into us. We've got the racking and and stuff stacked triple, triple high. Um, everything stays with us. Uh, we also have a have a um, a co-location warehouse about thirty miles from us, um, with a lot more space. So um, especially in Q four or when we do really really big buys, um, if it's something that's going to take a long a long time to sell. Um, we'll warehouse a lot of stuff there as well. And Barbara said, uh, how many employees do you have? I know you started out back when you were doing RA with you and uh, your buddy. Uh, how many do you have now to run the operation that you're doing? Zero employees. Zero. So just yourself? Just myself and my one partner. That's it. We've stayed that way the whole time. Um, so you don't use any VAs or anything like that? VAs is something that we that we would will use for for our administrative tasks, um, things like uh, entering in data or managing things online or making sure that things are flowing smoothly. Um, of course, you want to use VAs for that, and that's something that we continue to expand on and look into look into ways that we can um, uh, make that to be more efficient with with our operation. Um, but in terms of the actual operation here. Um, we don't because again, I have to remind you that our model is to buy deep and not wide. So for us, stuff comes in on a pallet, it leaves on a pallet. I mean, it's literally so easy to move a product in, move a product in and move a product out, um, that it doesn't require a whole lot of time. Um, now in 2017, that's going to be changing. We'll, we'll, I'll put someone back there who is going to be responsible for that just because we, the volume and the, um, the frequency of shipments has gone up so much um, that uh, it, it makes sense. But I will tell you, for the first few years of our business, even up to now, um, I, I don't have constantly the need to pay someone 40 hours a week to do the work. I just don't. Um, a lot of my business is talking to vendors, building relationships, finding or traveling to these trade shows. I travel like four months out of the year, four or five months out of the year. Um, you know, again, my, my focus on products is so specific and is so narrow that um, uh, I, I just don't, uh, I don't have the need. 
Um, and again, I, I, it's going to change a little bit in 2017 as we as we explore some other options. Um, but yeah, we, we've my, the two of us have run this from the ground up ever since 2012 and up until right now. Um, let's see. Molly says, "Do you buy legit toys from overseas as they are cheaper?" Yeah. So here's here's what I mean by by buying overseas. Okay. If I'm going to buy a full container of a product um, and I'm going to buy it from China, I'm not going to a site like Alibaba or one of those third-party sites and, and finding you know my product on there and, and sourcing it in large quantities um, and 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 bringing it, bringing it in. That's not what I'm doing because first off, when you're doing that, the stuff you're finding is most likely fake. Anything branded through that through, through sites like that it doesn't exist. Um, branded goods have a protected channel. So when I say I buy overseas, that means I'm going to a vendor. Um, you know, pick your toy vendor, right? Um, and I'm going to them and I'm saying, hey, I want to buy. I want to buy in uh, in a full container FOB China type quantity. Um, so normally the pricing is a little bit different. Um, and that just means basically I'm buying from their factory overseas. So instead of them uh, acquiring their product from their factory, bringing it into their warehouse, and then me taking it from their US location, I'm basically cutting out them from touching the goods. They know where it's coming from. It's coming from their same factory, but it's being shipped directly to me. So it's a lot, actually, actually a lot less risk and a lot less costly for them as a vendor because I'm taking it directly. Um, and that's why you'll be able to save usually quite a bit amount of uh, quite a bit of money um, as opposed to buying by the case or by the single pallet or the few pallets from domestically because they've had that extra cost that's already been built in. Uh, I think I know the answer to this anyway that Barbara has because you kind of said it yourself. But do you use prep centers or prep everything yourself? Nope. So we don't use prep centers. Everything is warehoused uh, on our location or at our co-location. Um, we do, I'm reading, I'm reading ahead. Um, we do not commingle, we sticker everything. Um, but because again, we don't have the, the labor at the moment to do that. Um, we don't label ourselves. So right now we're paying Amazon to do it for us. Um, but yeah, we do label everything. I, I'm not a fan of commingling. It's not something that, um, I've had good experience with. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, but yeah, we don't. And, uh, Amazon does our labeling for us. Ada says, so you FBA sub items and MF the rest? No, we're 99.9 .9 FBA. And Barbara's back on here saying, um, do you, I think she meant case pack. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not sure what the question is exactly, but when we, when we, when we buy product and when we send product, we're sending by the case. So yeah, um, if we buy, if I buy 5,000, for example, from a vendor, I might that might be made up of a thousand cases of five, you know. Um, or if I send to Amazon, I might I might send a hundred cases of six at a time, depending on what the volume is or, or whatever. But yeah, we're, we're we're usually processing by the case. Yeah. Molly says, do you encounter difficulties at the customs when you import all the legit toys from China? Nope. Um, we use a customs broker or a network of them, I should say, that uh, handle all of it for us. I. I have a logistics background myself, so I'm very familiar with moving freight around the country and, and getting stuff, you know, from one place to another. And, and my God, the, the the amount of numbers and, and formulas that I have in my head is is kind of disgusting. Um, I can I can build my shipments without even going to the pallet weighing stuff. I just know the the weights and stuff off the top of my head. It's it's kind of it's kind of gross. But uh, <laughs> um, I have. In terms of importing product, I my brokers they do that a lot of that legwork for me. The the customs clearing stuff and and the codes and all that stuff. That's not something that I really want to spend my time learning. In in my mind, I'm I'm paying the customs the customs agent to do that that work for me. So usually my email is to my customs guy is uh, my broker is uh, I have a full container from you know Shenzhen or wherever from the port of wherever in China. I need to get it to my door in, in Chicago. Uh, I need a price. You handle everything, like you know, getting it on the boat, in the port, clearing customs on the train from LA or Seattle or wherever it's coming from to me, and then truck to my door. You do it all. I don't want to touch it. So then usually they come back with a number, but I just you know over and above um, 
being very specific with the with the products that we that we pick. And the other thing that's allowed us to run this operation so lean is automating as much as possible. Um, and no matter who you listen to as a, as a wholesale expert, one thing that we all preach as as pretty common advice is automation is key. Um, being able to have people that can help you and a network of people that you use for different things is so critical. Yeah, absolutely. We we have freight broker and same type of thing. I mean, I, I don't. I've kind of looked at that and seen what they're up against and all the stuff that they're. And I, I don't want any part of that. So, right. we use the same type of thing. And um, yeah, you want to know landed costs. You want you want to know costs coming to your door, right sure. from China to the. And, and like I said, we do that too. And um, I don't envy anybody that tries to take on the task of wanting to do the. Uh, the customs brokerage and all that themselves. That's just, that's just crazy stuff. And you don't need to, cause you've got people out there and like what you just said, um, outsource it, you know, use, use the tools out there that you have available to you. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, we have a, we have a customs clearing agent who will handle a lot of our, our international importing. And then we have freight brokers who are domestic who, if we buy domestically, since that's another popular way we source, um, you know, we, I, I don't go direct to carriers. For example, I, I use a, a freight broker network. Um, and then they find me the best options. That's 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 the way you're going to save the most money anyway. If you go to a carrier like you know UPS Freight, for example, and you and you say, "Hey, I need to ship two pallets from here to here," it's going to cost you a fortune. Um, you've got you've got to use a broker. I mean, they, they get like ninety percent off. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, totally agree. Yeah. See, um, Barbara said distributed inventory or split to different fulfillment centers. So I guess she's asking if you're using the the preferred service where you pay the the extra to have it go to one warehouse. Um, we are not. We we let them send to wherever they want. Um, we did. The, we ran the figures for us, and uh, you know, is it, it would it be easier for us from a shipment perspective? Yeah, but the the financial gain from that wasn't really a ton. Um, it was actually going to cost us a lot more because we have a lot of small products, and you know, they charge by the product, obviously. Um, so it, it it didn't make sense for us, but. Uh, uh, I know in certain models it does, so I won't. I won't. They won't say it's wrong, um, but for us, it, it just doesn't work, and and we just we have them sent wherever it's going. Um, you know, but for us, it might be I guess where we're located. Um, for us being in the Chicago area, I don't know if you sent to I think it's MDW two or Joliet. Um, Joliet, Illinois is a is a redistribution center, and I would say eighty five percent of our stuff goes there. So it's, I mean, when I tell you we can ship for cheap, it's really cheap. Um, half a truck, a truck for like 200, 300 bucks, really cheap. Yeah, it's like when it goes to Nashville or to the, the, you know, the locations here in Tennessee, we don't always get them, but we have tested before sending it to one warehouse and we find that it doesn't matter if it goes to one warehouse or not. Um, Amazon's gonna distribute it where they want it to whatever warehouse they want it. So it was not just about the cost of shipping into those warehouses. It was the cost of the time that we were losing anyway, because once they ship it and move it from where you sent it originally, money anyway. So we just let them, like you, we just let them send it wherever they want to send it. I mean, Barbara, I'm, just, I'm, looking, I'm looking at Barbara's last point here. I mean, she said she's joking. Maybe I'll move. Maybe I'll move. I mean, all joking, <laughs> as, all joking aside, um, you know, I grew up in the Chicago area. I, mean, I didn't pick this location because of this business. I, I've been here my whole life, right? Um, but it's been a tremendous advantage for us in this business because we're 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 so centered in the nation. We're the we're the, we're the rail capital of the nation. Um, that getting stuff from the East Coast or Ohio or Florida or the West Coast, I mean, it's so easy to get freight moved around here. And usually, when we're sending to Amazon. You know, there's there's facilities sprinkled all over. There's Joliet, there's Kenosha, Wisconsin, there's Kentucky, there's Indiana, there's Tennessee, there's Virginia, there's oh my god! I mean, in, in the period of four years, I, I can't even keep track of how many they've been opening. But we're it seems it seems like they just surround us. So I would say seldomly do we have to send stuff across country. I mean, we send occasionally we'll get the shipment that's going to that's going to California or Arizona or Texas or something, but. Um, it's usually not a lot, so I, I guess that's probably another reason why I, I don't mind distributing my inventory around because it doesn't really happen that much. Yeah, and it's like where we're located in Tennessee. There's like eleven or twelve of them around us, considering the seven state area. So, right, 
we do send them. And like you, you're right. I mean, they're opening up centers all the time. I seen a new one the other day. I never even heard of that they had. And, and, I, and I and I think they're they're shifting around. Uh, you know what fulfillment centers handle what product. I mean, we used to send to Indianapolis all the time when we first started. And I don't think I've sent there in a year. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I, I, yeah, that I was like Philly. Philly. I just go with what they tell me. <laughs> I Philly a lot too, and I don't think we've sent there. And and you know, being in Nashville, being here in Tennessee, you would think Nashville and Chattanooga would be the ones that we send to, but. Um, not we send more into Kentucky than we do into Tennessee. Yeah, but but again, it's just it's just a neighboring state, so it's not like it's that far. Exactly. Molly says, if you don't mind, could you share your shipping broker's contact? In yeah. So um, I don't know what's easiest for you, but if if I can post it in the group if you'd like, I, I have no problem sharing. I have no problem sharing that. Yeah, you can post it in the chat if you want. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to ask you is. Um, not ASD because we all know that that's a, a variety type show, but some of the shows for people on here that want to go into wholesale and are looking for wholesale suppliers shows that you know that they're going to find true suppliers, wholesale suppliers at. Not like ASD where you find middlemen and people. It's kind of funny because at ASD you can find the manufacturer, a middleman, and someone else too there. I mean, it's, if you can see that there's six different companies carrying a product and the manufacturers they're carrying it too. <laughs> right, 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 for sure. Uh, you go, to, you can go to ASD, and you can find six vendors with the same product with six different prices. So I mean, that's, exactly, it's yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my answer to that question would be, it really depends. I, I don't like to give an answer in terms of specific shows, and here's why: because what works for me and what works for you is going to be different things. Um, so rather than me tell you, here's a list of shows that I would I would go to, and it's going to be those are going to be worth your while. Here's what I'll tell you. Find a product category that you are familiar with or that you want to sell in, whether it be toys, housewares, lawn and garden, baby, whatever it is. Then you type in that category, you know, baby trade shows, toys trade shows, hardware trade shows. Find that, do it that way, find your shows there. And then once you find a show that covers that category, once you start talking to the vendors, I then ask them, hey, where else do you exhibit? Where else do you show? You'd be surprised how many leads you can get from that. I mean, and I play stupid. When I ask my vendors and I say, where else do you show? And they tell me, I go, oh, yeah, I know that one. And I walk away going, what the hell is that? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. You know, you just you use them from the information they have, which, believe me, they've got a ton. Yeah, it's funny because I do that same exact thing and I play dumb. And I'll say, hey, man, when you guys leave Vegas, where are you guys heading next? You know, and they'll say Chicago or Dallas or – yeah. Atlanta, you know, they, it kind of, yeah, you do. It kind of bounces around. Another good show that, you know, if people, if you have, if you like animals, um, the pet shows are really good shows to go to too. No, oh, pet, I, I totally forgot about that category. Pet is a big category of ours. I mean, that's a great category. It totally that escaped me, but yeah, it's a, it's a big one too. So uh, let's see. Barbara says, do you plan to explore selling in Europe, Amazon and building private label products? Um, so we're already ex we we already sell um, cross border, um, so that's something that we have have been working with, um, and then building PL products. Yeah, so we're going to get into private label um, in seventeen. We actually have our our first few products um, right now being developed overseas. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're going to add to our mix. Um, we're going to uh, bring on the the private label side as well to our to our currently existing all wholesale model. Yeah, those are fun products. When you start doing private labeling and getting the test products and stuff like that, we've been doing that for a little while, and it's well, it's kind of nice when you got your own brand and stuff like that. Yeah, I think I think I just want to go back one second. I missed uh, Barbara. We missed Barbara's question. She said, "Do you have suppliers shipped directly to your Amazon account?" Um, and this is a, a question that I get asked commonly, um, and is one that I uh, always like to answer. Absolutely, a hundred percent, no. Um, and here's why. Is it cheaper? Possibly. Most likely, yeah. Is it a lot less labor intensive because they're shipping it directly? Yeah. But here's the thing. Amazon looks at your account as your responsibility. Okay. I have a business that's tied to my Amazon account. I have rent that's due here every month. I have bills to pay. I have, uh, I have my salary to pay. I have uh, um, products to pay for. I have a lot of things riding in this business. I will not put my Amazon account 
a core driver of revenue and profits for us in the hands of a vendor because mistakes happen. We're all human. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't have that trust factor with any of my vendors to, to run my business for me. I have a trust factor in terms of the product and their relationship, but I will not put their warehouse or whoever else they're, they're tasking to send their products, uh, out, out with, um, into my Amazon account, because if something's wrong, they send the wrong product, they short it, or it's whatever, a bad product expired, who knows? Um, it's a mess to clean up. So uh, that's another, that's a, that's the biggest reason why I bring everything in house. It's just, I, I don't, I don't like that model. Yeah. And I, I agree with that too. Uh, we don't send anything direct for the simple reason is also, they're not going to care for it as well as you're going to care for it. And if you're not going to do like Eddie and you don't have the facility to bring it in house yourself, then you, you send it to a reputable fulfillment center. That could be that middleman that can check it and spot check it and make sure everything's where it needs to be. And here, here's here's the other thing. You're you're building this whole business on on building value, right? So, building value to a vendor and then asking them to do your work for you is the opposite, right? If you want to build value, you've got to you've got to you've got to do some of the work. If you're going to ask them to just you know take the product from their warehouse and put it into your shelves, what are you giving them? Honestly, I mean you're you're not taking on any risk. Yeah, and the other little twist, like I said, you could use fulfillment centers to do it. But the other little twist is, and we've had this happen where we've had people that were doing wholesale products, and they taught, they actually taught the distributor how to send it to Amazon, label it, and everything. And guess what? Now the distributor sells it themselves, and they cut them out because exactly. they taught, they cut they taught them how to do it. Exactly. I, I'm a I'm a big believer in um you know you you tell people what they need to know, but not uh, not too much to where they know exactly how your business works. For example, I I have. Uh, went back when we were doing a lot of the closeout type stuff, I would have vendors that would email me lists of products and it would have, oh, here's the sales rank, here's the amount you can make after fees. I just hated that because I'm going, if my vendor, the one who's selling my product, is going to do all my work for me, what makes you think it's a good deal? I mean, they're going to work for you. Do you think they're going to then give you 40 points of margin? Forget it. It's not going to happen. Give me a break. <laughs> And in the closeout business, that's happening a lot. They're educating themselves now where I still do close out and I get those lists where they go in there and they'll show you and then they'll show you the Amazon price. And I'm saying to myself, okay, if they know the Amazon price, then they think this is what they're gonna sell it to me for. So, yeah, I mean I mean I, I just I don't I don't believe in, in in vendors doing your work for you or or or, or deciding what you can make on a product. Like, that's your decision. I don't need I don't need them to do it. There's, there's people say, you know, they want a lot of information. I'll tell you this. I, I believe there's definitely cases where you get too much information, and that is one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Barbara wants to know if you're going to go to China or for the Canton show. Most likely, yeah. Um, it's on my calendar. Um, I haven't figured out exactly if I'm 100%. I'd say it's probably about a 90-ish right now, um, and I have no idea what phase I'm going to go for, but especially since we're adding the private label into our mix, um, and I've got some people who are – Familiar with that model? Who are going to be overseas? Uh, most likely, yeah. Yeah, I want to get out there. I haven't been out there. Yet. I wanted to go last year, but again, like I said, I had my heart attack and it kind of slowed me down. But I, I know some people that are going to be out there that are very familiar with working the Canton Fair. And the nice thing about it, they tell me, is that there's so many of them now there that speak English that it's not like it used to be years ago, where you had to do that um, language barrier thing. Now they can understand you just as much as uh, if you're doing the same thing in the United States. So, right. Yep. Exactly. Barbara said she's go she's seriously considering going. So you should uh, go. <laughs> you should go for sure. So hey Eddie, we're going over an hour here. I mean, I like to keep you guys about an hour. Um, real good, valuable information from you. It's a pleasure having you here. If anybody wants to get a hold of you. Um, how can they get a hold of you to answer questions or for anything that they might want to ask you? Um, best way to do it is to go to our Facebook group. It's Wholesale Breakthrough. Uh, myself and my partner are the admins in that group. Um, just go ahead and uh, go Facebook, search Wholesale Breakthrough, um, just like it sounds, two words, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, approve you into the group. We post some, we post some tip, uh, tips and tricks and things that we uh, uh, experience and, and want to get out to you guys. Um, and if you have questions, you're more than welcome to post it uh, in there as well. Uh, and then if, you need, if you'd like to email me directly, um, you can do that as well, eddie at wholesalebreakthrough.com. That's great. 
Hey guys, I'm going to give Eddie the last word. I always give my guests the last word. We do appreciate you being here. We know this time of the year being the holidays that there's other webinars and other things you could be doing. So we do sure appreciate you coming on the show with us. Um, I want to personally wish all you guys happy holidays and Merry Christmas. You all stay safe and um, get to your families and visits, uh, whatever you need to do for the holidays. And that you're all, like I said, make sure you're all safe and in, in your travels and Eddie, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas, too, and um, you and learning some things from you tonight that, you know, some of the things that I wasn't aware of, um, you know, you always learn something no matter how old you are. And, and that's, I think, the one thing about this business is when you're going into this, have an open mind. If you're willing to, to sit there and, and listen and learn and have an open mind, you can learn new things every day. And some of the things you taught me uh, that I listened to you today you know, kind of taught me a little few things too. So I appreciate that. And hopefully um, you guys learned something from me and Eddie tonight that you can take with you into 2017. I think the one thing that Eddie has uh, taught us tonight is that you can go deep in wholesale and you can make money. You just got to buy it right and you got to do your research and you'll be okay. And like he said, uh, one thing I heard Eddie say is that he likes to stay around that 5,000 rank or lower in toys. Uh, he didn't tell us the rank in the other categories, but I mean, I think that's a great rank to be around um, when you're buying that type of volume. And it also allows him to be able to sell through quicker. And I also heard him say that even though they're brand name products, he does do pay per click and he does do advertising to advertise the products, which I think is key because I think a lot of people think that the listing on Amazon is brand name. It's just going to do its own magic. Well, he's helping draw to the product advertising and I think that's real key to help him um, be able to you know set him apart from a lot of the sellers and that's probably why he sells as well as he does is because he does his homework and he's out there advertising brand name products for them so if you go to Mattel or you go to Hasbro or you go to any of these big companies and say hey listen I'm gonna promote and advertise your product with my money they're gonna stand up and listen to you that's when you're gonna make a difference you go and say hey I'm gonna sell it online and you know I'm just gonna be the next seller on there Eddie's not doing that. Eddie's coming to them and saying, hey, this is what I can do for you, and this is how I can get visibility to your product, um, but I can get visibility on Shopify, my own website, and other platforms, Walmart.com, and those type of things. That's what he's doing. So if you guys were listening tonight, I would pay attention to those things. Like I said, that's a new twist that I haven't heard where people actually were advertising and doing pay-per-click for brand-name products. Something I'm going to look into. I think that... Um, I've been told in the past that you don't do that, but Eddie's doing it and he's being very successful. And guess what? Because he's doing it, he's ahead of the curve and a lot of people that are not doing it are behind the curve. So again, Eddie, it's great having you here. I'm going to give you the last word before we call it a night. Great. Um, just three quick points. I'll just summarize uh, my, my take on what you said there. Um, the advertising, it's key. Um, I, I did a bunch of new campaigns over the holiday season this year. Um, I spent around two or three, four thousand dollars on advertising. My ACOS, which if you're doing private label and doing advertising already, you kind of know that term, um, is hovering around 2 to 4%, depending on where, what the campaign is. It has generated, those campaigns have generated over $60,000 of sales for me. So if you don't know advertising and you don't know, don't think it's valuable, even for branded products, you are sorely mistaken. Um, it is a great, great feature, and you should absolutely look into it. So that's that's point one. Um, point two, don't be afraid to fail. I fail all the time with things that I try new. Uh, even four or five years into this business now, I fail on things that I try all the time. I I figure out what what went, what went wrong, and I try again, and I I ultimately succeed. But so, sometimes it takes three or four tries. Um, so just because you're getting re you know rejected or you're, you something doesn't go your way. You gotta keep going forward. If you if you let yourself be defeated, you're you you are your own worst enemy. Not the vendors, not anything they tell you. None of that. You're your own worst enemy. Um, so that's point two, and then point three is really just for you, John. I, I appreciate you you giving me the opportunity to join you on the on the uh, webinar tonight. Um, and likewise, it was great talking to you and, and your group members, and uh, it was it was a great conversation. And I hope that uh, uh, you yourself and all your members here have a great uh, great happy holiday season and and, and a fantastic new year. Thanks, Eddie, and God bless. And yeah, I always say that I'll leave this one last word, what you just said. I always say that um, word, sorry, <laughs> but I had to say this because 
when you say about feeling, absolutely. But guys, when you're feeling, you have to look at it as feeling forward. Yep. You're always feeling forward, not backwards. And if you're looking at it as feeling forward, you're not feeling. You're learning from what you've done in the past, and you're, and you're moving forward. So it's just feeling forward. That's the term I'm going to leave with you guys. Eddie, God bless. Have a good holiday, and uh, thanks, my friend. Good night. Thank you.